In the 1600s, René Descartes proposed that the human brain and nervous system were an elaborate network of fluid-filled pipes which controlled the body. He was inspired by the hydraulic animated statues that delighted the nobility of Europe. In the 1700s, there was a craze for autonomy, clockwork machines which looked and acted like people, writing, drawing and even playing the flute. Physician and philosopher Julien Lamétrie wrote a book called Man the Machine, which claimed that the human body, including the brain, is just a self-winding machine, a collection of springs. He had to publish anonymously because of the troubling implication that if a clockwork brain explains all human thoughts and behaviour, then we have no soul. Coinciding with the spread of telegraph cables in the 1800s, 19th century thinkers compared the nervous system to a telegraph network. The analogy lives on today when we talk of signals being transmitted from the nerves to the brain. As strange as these historical cases might seem, they weren't just speculation for the sake of it. Comparing something you don't understand, like the brain, with a machine you do understand, is an important part of scientific methodology. Today's go-to analogy for the brain is a computer. We store information in our memory and take time to process new information. But is this any more than mere metaphor, one which appeals to us because the computer is the most advanced technological device around, or is it that the brain really is a computer? The word computer first meant the people, typically women, whose job it was to perform mathematical operations by hand before digital computers took over the work. When Alan Turing laid the conceptual foundations of modern computing with the Turing machine, he was thinking about how to break down and automate the steps that a human computer makes when performing a routine task. Now our digital computers do much more than add and subtract. They play chess, fly planes, beat us in game shows, wheel and deal on the stock market. Do they manage all this because they work like us? Because they replicate the way our brain works? And is it possible that we can better understand how the brain works by comparing it with a computer? It's worth breaking down the different ways this could turn out. First, it's possible that the brain does literally work like a computer. Here we need to separate hardware and software. It's always been clear that the hardware of the brain is completely different from that of a computer. For example, computers have central processing units, control centers where their algorithms get executed. There's no CPU in the brain. Control appears to be distributed around numerous different structures. Even if the hardware is completely different, it might still be that the brain performs the same basic operations that a computer does. In other words, that the software is the same. One reason to think this is unlikely is that the brain has evolved over millions of years, whereas computer software is designed by human engineers who solve problems and write code. The often roundabout solutions that natural selection hits upon are unlikely to be the same ones that would seem optimal to a software engineer. A second possibility is that there is no concrete sense in which your brain works like a computer at all. It's merely a metaphor. Given the concerns just raised about taking the computer analogy too literally, there may be something to the scepticism. But even if computational approaches are merely metaphorical in this sense, they may still be useful metaphors. It is thus worth exploring a third possibility that seeks a middle ground between these literal and sceptical attitudes towards the computer analogy. Namely, it's possible that the brain does not work exactly like a computer, but that it does nonetheless use some of the elements that are central to computational theory, like algorithms, symbolic representations, and logical functions. In other words, it may be fruitful to think about the brain as performing computations even if those computations are very different from those we'd find in a computer. This idea is the starting point of a field of research called computational neuroscience. For example, neuroscientists have developed an explanation of how an owl so precisely works out where prey is positioned by looking at the computations performed in its brain. Neurons in a specific circuit 
respond to the tiny differences in the arrival time of a sound at the owl's two ears. This gives a reliable output of the prey's position. But how far can neuroscientists go by thinking of the brain in computational terms? One of the advantages of the computational approach is that it helps neuroscientists formulate theories about the function of neural systems. When you open the skull and look inside, what's there is a collection of billions of cells linked together by a tangle of nerve fibres. We need theories of function in order to unravel that tangle and to understand which features of those cells and fibres are relevant to behaviour. And so the computational approach provides an important step towards understanding how the brain works and fixing it when it goes wrong.